Previously on B Squared. When I'm on the road, editing duties fall to this MSI Titan GT80 SLI, which I bought in 2015 from a company called Computer Upgrade King. Now at the time that I bought it, the MSI Titan was considered one of the heavy hitters of the gaming world, and it came loaded with just about everything you could ask for and then some. And to top it all off, the Titan was designed to be easily disassembled to give you access to the inner components so that if something wore out or if technology advanced, instead of buying a whole new computer, much as I just did, you could actually upgrade components as you went. Coming up, one laptop to rule them all? Maybe, maybe not, but one thing's for sure. This one's definitely a Titan among giants. An inside look at the pride of MicroStar International starts right now. Greetings and welcome, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Brandon Bridges, and this is B Squared. So if you're like most people, you've probably gone through one computer after another over the years, always buying a new one whenever your needs changed, or whenever you just wanted something bigger, better, faster, or more realistically, probably with more RGB LEDs. Looking at you, gamers. But what if I told you that everybody watching could buy the exact same system today, and no matter what's your occupation, you'd be set for a good couple of years at least? I can hear the moans and groans of disbelief from the audience already, but I'm not kidding. I actually found one that kept me going for a good seven years, which ain't no small thing. Sound too good to be true? Stay tuned. So we're talking about the MSI Titan GT80, which has the distinction of being the first computer I've ever heard described as a luggable. A man named Olin coined that term back in 2015, and he was right. The thing lives up to its name in terms of heft, not to mention price, but the specs make it worth it. Let me introduce you to the configuration that I have, and we'll fill in the backstory from there. I placed the order for my Titan on June 24, 2015, and for the lofty sum of $39.50.99 plus shipping and handling, I got a system with some impressive specs for the time. An 18-inch screen with 1080p resolution, an i7-5950HQ processor, 32GB of RAM, a pair of 256GB M2 SSDs plus a 2TB mechanical hard drive, a pair of NVIDIA GeForce GTX 980M GPUs in an SLI configuration and with a total of 16 gigabytes of RAM, a backlit Cherry MX mechanical keyboard, and a DVD RW drive that could also read Blu-rays. The system came with Windows 8, but by that point I'd been in the Windows Insider program for about seven months, and even though it was still experimental, I preferred Windows 10 over Windows 8 by far, and I couldn't install it fast enough. And if Gabe All is out there, yes, I did what you said not to and used Windows Insider Builds as my main operating system. What's life without a little risk? In the present day, I dual boot between Windows 10 and Windows 11, even though officially Microsoft says it doesn't meet the requirements for Windows 11, so I've more or less tried every modern operating system on this computer, and they've all run fairly smoothly, even the most problematic of the Windows Insider Builds. Aside from upgrading Windows, the hardware configuration hasn't changed a bit in all the years I've owned it, and the system's been able to handle everything I've thrown at it in the meantime. 2D graphics, 3D graphics, editing in HD, and even editing at 4K. It's been stable, reliable, and it's never overheated, although coworkers did like to tease me when the fans would start because it does sound kind of like a plane taking off. And even after seven years of almost continuous use, I've never had to replace any of the components, with one exception, but we'll talk about that later. Honestly, I keep expecting one of the SSDs to fail, but so far I haven't had any trouble with it. Not in seven years. No trouble in seven years, and as I say that, I'm knocking on wood because, well, let's just say I know how my luck tends to run. So before we go on, I want to say a few things up front. First, the experience with the Titan has not been 100% positive, but what experience that lasts for seven years ever is perfect? Second, despite the issues, I do still recommend the Titan, and that's because I don't think anything that's happened represents a problem either with MSI as a company or the Titan series specifically. Third, this is the first gaming class system I've ever owned, and you know it was designed for gaming because LEDs, and yet, gaming is probably the thing that I've spent the least time doing with it. Crazy, huh? 
So before I got the Titan, I was working with a pair of Acer Aspire Ethos 8951Gs, try saying that 10 times fast, and they were decent enough systems in their own right. They had big screens, good sound systems, they had Blu-ray drives, the works. But the problem was, they weren't really built to be user upgradable. On top of that, the touchpads that they came with were detachable, and aside from the fact that they never really worked that well to begin with, they were also prone to severe battery swelling. Happened to both of mine less than 18 months after I bought them. And because of the way they were built, when the batteries did swell, the entire touchpad just came apart and all you were left with was some plastic and wires and not a whole heck of a lot else. Technically, I could still use external mice, but that kind of negated the whole mobile aspect of having a laptop to begin with. So I started looking around. The 8951Gs were the last of the Acer Gemstone Blue series, basically a series of high-end desktop replacements, which meant that they came with features that you couldn't find just anywhere. So what I needed was something with same features or better, with a mouse that wouldn't be at risk for battery problems. Sounds simple, right? I looked for months, and I tried pretty much every brand name there is. Dell, HP, even Acer, since the 8951s had not been the first product of theirs that I'd bought. I didn't try Asus or Alienware because in those days I thought gaming hardware meant stuff that was only good for gaming but wouldn't work for productivity or media development. What can I say? We all live and learn and today everything I own is gaming class or better and I'm proud of it. And before anyone asks, not once did I type A-P-P-L-E into my search bar. Not once. We'll get into the reasons why another time. Anyway, once I came across MSI, I finally caved and started looking at the gaming world. What I found was a collection of shiny new gear that was often as expensive as it was powerful. But MSI seemed to consistently come out ahead of the others, both in terms of what they offered and from what I could see in reviews, so I decided to give them a shot. So what you should know about me is that over the years, I've used laptops from pretty much every manufacturer there is. I got my start in 1996. How long ago was that? I don't think I can count that high anymore. Anyway, it started way back when with a laptop by Fujitsu. That was followed a couple of years later by a Toshiba satellite, and then from there I went through a couple of flavors of Dell Inspiron, and so on from there. Suffice it to say, I've tried them all, and I think the best way to say it is that some are better than others. But once I started getting into 3D animation and video and such, your garden variety office laptops didn't cut it anymore, and that's actually what led me to the 8951Gs in the first place. At the time, they had the most processing power for the asking price, and I actually wound up getting two of them. So when the time came to upgrade again, what I really needed was one system that could take the place of two, but without sacrificing portability. And the thing was, I wasn't really fussy about who to buy from. If anything, in those days, I was more determined about who I wasn't going to buy from, but again, we can talk about that some other time. But the thing was, that still left a lot of possibilities because no one company really had my loyalty as a shopper. Now, if you saw my unboxing video a few months ago, then you'll know that I just bought my second MSI system, so obviously they did something right. But when I was shopping around in 2015, they were a complete unknown. So when I came across the Titan, it became the system to beat, and ultimately nothing else could quite match it. MSI apparently had a good reputation besides, so I took the plunge and got myself a Titan. So on the subject of the unboxing video, a lot of you are probably wondering, if the Titan is so awesome, why did Brandon show us the unboxing of a brand new system just a few short months ago? The answer is, the Titan is awesome and amazing and expandable, but the problem is, even with all those capabilities, I outgrew it. See, the thing is, when I bought the Titan seven years ago, the configuration that I bought was pretty much maxed out. I could have installed a few more M2 SSDs or gotten a bigger mechanical hard drive if I'd wanted to, but if I wanted anything like more RAM or a better processor, I would have had to get an all-new motherboard, and I figured it was easier just to get a new computer. Doesn't change the fact that the Titan is still an amazing system, and I have no intention of getting rid of mine, not even now that I have the Raider. And matter of fact, the Titan still plays an active role in my workflow. To quote Jordy LaForge, just because something's old doesn't mean you throw it away. So since I know my audience loves irony, I'll go ahead and get this out of the way. One of the big reasons that I bought the Titan was because it was supposedly easy to upgrade, and I've never actually done it. Matter of fact, I've only ever had the casing open once, and that was just to see how easy it was. How easy is it? Easier than some systems I've owned, but still not what I'd call convenient. All the primary components are right below the faceplate between the keyboard and the screen, so if you ever do need to swap something out, 
Everything's right there in easy reach once you get the faceplate off. Just make sure you read the instructions before you do it, and don't just try to pull the faceplate off. Now, as far as the user experience goes, the Titan can be a bit of a mixed bag, but it does generally trend positive. So if you're wondering if I'd buy it again, knowing what I know now, the answer is yes, I would, absolutely. The biggest issue with the Titan wasn't necessarily anything with the system itself, but rather what it was replacing. If you remember my unboxing video, then you'll recall that one of the things I liked best about the 8951G was that phenomenal sound system with the built-in subwoofer. It sounded great, and it would have been a tough act to follow no matter how good the next thing was. Now, the Titan may not have a woofer, but it does have a top-shelf sound card. And what that means is, while the open-air speakers may not sound quite as good, throw in a set of earbuds and there's absolutely no contest. The Titan sounds a lot better than the Acer did. And that makes a certain amount of sense considering the Titan is a gaming system and the Acer wasn't. Sidebar, but I want to talk for a minute about how I go about testing a new sound system to figure out if it's any good. And no, I'm not one of those people that goes into Best Buy, cranks the volume up on a system playing an obnoxious hip-hop song, playing it so loud that nobody can have a conversation anywhere else inside the store. Frankly, I don't know why those stores put up with that. But as obnoxious as it is, I do think the people that do that do have the right idea. You do need a piece of music that you know really well and that you've already heard from a variety of sound systems. That way, when you hear it from a new one, you'll be able to assess how good it is. Or not. For me, this is that piece of music. See if you recognize it. Hopefully you recognize the theme from The Price is Right. I don't mean the new one from 2007. That version was a freshly reorchestrated stereo version that they made when Drew Carey took over. The one that you're hearing is a direct copy of the Studio Master from 1972. Now aside from the sentimental value, it does remind me of all the times I watched it with my grandmother growing up. What you may not know is that the original music package was done in mono, not stereo, and it's from a time before game show music really tended to have a lot of bass. Now there's a version of it that came out on one of those TV's Greatest Hits compilation sets back in 1996. I don't know where that one came from, but it's different than what the show was actually using. For one thing, it's in stereo, but there's a few other minor differences as well. The one that I use is a direct copy of the Studio Master from 1972, and I've heard it literally from every audio device that I own. So here's what makes it such a good piece of music to test with. Aside from the fact that I know it so well, the fact that it's so old, and in mono at that, means that any system that can make it sound good today must be a good one. The sad truth is, a lot of people in the present day are only interested in the lower frequencies, which is where bass comes from, but you'd be surprised how many of these bass-heavy systems actually make the classic Price is Right theme sound terrible. The reason is, these ultra-bass systems tend to scrimp on the higher frequencies, and parts of the old theme actually sound like they're coming from underwater. I wish I was kidding, but I'm not. Before we go on, I want to let you hear how it sounds from a couple of different sound systems, including the Titans, so you can hear the differences for yourself. You might want to use earbuds for this part if you're not already. Here we go. Ed Kalehoff, come on down! See what I mean? It's the exact same piece of music, but no two sets of speakers expressed it the same way. It's like I said before, some are just better than others. Anyway, to get back on topic, the Titan was the first system I owned that came with an SSD, and I was amazed at how fast the boot cycle was. The next fastest system I had was the 8951G, which had been designed for Windows 7 and which worked off a mechanical hard drive. Even once the Windows desktop came up, it was usually a good couple of minutes, plural, before I could actually do anything with it. Compared to that, the lightning-fast response time of the Titan seemed almost miraculous. Nowadays, we take SSDs for granted, but back then, this was something. Another nice thing is the 18-inch screen. Now, I know you're probably out there thinking, well, you've seen one 1080p screen, you've seen them all. 
but this is an area where every little bit can make a difference. True, the screen may only be capable of 1080p resolution, standard at the time, but well before 4K was a thing. That extra inch of screen space over a 17 inch can actually give you a bigger workspace, especially if you turn the magnification down. Speaking of someone whose Illustrator workflow more or less depends on having a second monitor because of all the flyouts I use, just trust me on this one. The extra inch of screen real estate makes a huge difference. To put it in perspective, next to the Titan, the 17 inch screen on my Raider feels almost claustrophobically small. Far as colors go, out of the box, the Titan screen was bright and clear and had amazing color depth, and it still does even after seven years. Meanwhile, take a look at the screen on the 8951G. It hasn't held up nearly as well, despite the fact that it's seen comparatively less use in the same amount of time than the Titan. Nothing against Acer, but the Titan clearly has the superior screen. Now, contrary to what the first few episodes of B Squared might lead you to believe, I am not a gamer. I bought the Titan, and the Raider for that matter, more as mobile platforms for content creation than for anything else, so I can't really have a conversation about gaming performance. What I can tell you is that this system handles classic emulators, including Project 64, just fine even when the graphic settings for those programs are maxed out. The only quote-unquote real games that I've played on it are Portal, Portal 2, and Myst. Shout out to our friends at Valve for making all that possible thanks to Steam. And as far as I could tell, they all ran perfectly. Very smooth and with no drop frames that I could see. I do want to give Seamu a try one of these days just to see how the Titan handles Breath of the Wild, but after the experience of getting it up and running on my radar, I'm not exactly eager to put myself through that again. But we'll see. Maybe one of these days. Just a quick flash forward, wanted to let you know that I did wind up giving Seamu a go on the Titan, and I gotta say, I was pleasantly surprised by what happened. The game I tested with was Breath of the Wild, and pretty much from the get-go it ran about as smoothly as I could have asked for. Performance was about on par with how I'd expect it to run on native hardware, maybe even a little better. There was no drop in frame rate, no stuttering, no control input lag, none of the problems that you'd expect running a game like this through an emulator. I did enable FPS++ and extended memory and all the other things they say to do to optimize CMU's performance, but I didn't really have to do much more than that. The one thing that I did wind up doing differently on the Titan was to enable VSync, and that's because there was some tearing between the top half of the screen and the bottom half, but change one thing in NVIDIA control panel and problem solved just that fast. If I had to guess, I'd say the dual GPU is probably how a game like Breath of the Wild runs as smoothly as it does on a system this old. I do know it pulls some serious processing power for sure, because the fans start up anytime I start playing. Matter of fact, you can probably hear it right now even though we're just idling on the title screen. I will say that this is one area where apparently the Titan is a lot more powerful than I gave it credit for. Live and learn! Let's talk about the keyboard next. So if you've never used a Cherry MX mechanical keyboard before, you're really missing out. Typing on this thing is an experience. A lot of laptops use chiclets for their keyboards, and for lack of a better term, that can feel rubbery, but not this one. The keyboard feels sturdy and durable, and there's an audible click when you press a key. I like it because it feels like you're typing on a regular keyboard instead of a laptop, which is really nice. As far as the layout goes, you basically have a full-size keyboard right there in front of you, complete with a full set of function keys. The backlights are all bright red and they can only do one color, but as far as I can tell, they're still just as bright as the day I bought the system. Gotta say I'm impressed. Now where the number pad would be, instead you've got the touchpad, which can double as a number pad, but if you've seen my unboxing video, then you know how that turned out, so I'm not going to rehash it here. Speaking strictly as a mouse, touchpad works great. Good pointer motion, no dead spots. Go Synaptics! The Titan does have a webcam, but the quality isn't that great, and for most things I actually prefer the one on my Surface, but we won't tell Microsoft about that. Anyway, that's a discussion for another time. Let's get back to the Titan. I guess that just leaves the I.O., and that's actually one of my favorite things about the way the Titan is designed. It comes with a slew of USB ports, five in all, and they are all USB 3. Let me say that again. A laptop has five full-sized USB 3 ports. It's great when I take it on the road, because it means I can hook up more than one USB drive without sacrificing the ability to have an external mouse if I need it.
I know I could use external USB hubs, but I try to stay away from those because they can be of questionable reliability. As far as video ports go, the system has the standard full-sized HDMI port, but it's also got a pair of mini display port connectors, which in theory means that you could have up to three external monitors hooked up at once. I've only ever tried one, and I'm kind of wishing now that I tried more than that. In terms of form factor, this is not a system for the faint of heart. I've heard this particular line of systems referred to as both gaming systems and desktop replacements. And while both are certainly accurate, when it comes to sheer form factor, it is a desktop replacement through and through. In other words, this thing is heavy. Just the system itself weighs 10 pounds, and that's not counting the power brick. And just look at the power brick. It is portable in the sense that you can unplug it, put it in a bag, and take it on the road without suffering any loss of performance. But this isn't the type of system that you'll be able to use on the tray table on a plane, say. And believe me, I've tried. If I can't make it work on a flight to a place like Germany or Guam, it can't be done. So as awesome as the Titan is, I have run into a few issues along the way. Now most of them were minor and had the same fix, but some weren't so minor. First, the system that I bought turned out to have a defective motherboard. It didn't start having problems right away. For the first few months, everything was fine. Then, one day seemingly out of the blue, I started getting timeout errors from the GPU. Around the same time, the computer started having problems resuming from standby. The lights would come on, but then they'd flicker, and instead of picking back up where I'd left off, the computer would completely reboot, and I'd lose whatever work I hadn't saved. Luckily, it was still within the warranty period, so I just sent it back for repairs, and I haven't had any trouble with the motherboard since then. Easy peasy. The other issues that I've run into have all been really minor. I just mentioned them because they are things that I would have wanted to know going in. Wouldn't have stopped me from buying it, but still good to know. So after I'd had the system for about a year, I woke up one day to find that the system had rebooted into the BIOS, and nothing I did seemed able to get it into Windows. My first thought was that the SSD might have failed, but turns out that all I needed was a CMOS reset. Pull out the power cable, hold down the power button for 10 to 15 seconds, then reinsert power cable, hit power button, and voila, system comes up just like normal. From what I've been able to gather since then, a CMOS reset is the most common solution to problems on this model, so bear that in mind if you decide to get one. The only other issue I've really seen is that sometimes the system will register a dual key press when I only did one. Like if I hit enter to run a batch file, sometimes, not all the time, not every time, not frequently, just sometimes, the system will think I hit enter twice and two instances of the batch file will pop up. I have no idea what causes it. It did annoy me at first, but after seven years, I guess I just got used to it. And whatever the issue is, it seems limited to the built-in SteelSeries keyboard, since this has never happened with a USB keyboard. Since it's not a huge issue and there are workarounds, I'm not really losing sleep over it. The last thing is something that happened early on, but seems to have disappeared over the years, and I'd be lying if I said I understood why. When I first got the system, the Wi-Fi adapter would quit working as soon as I did anything that took a lot of bandwidth, like downloading a new build of Windows 10 or any kind of streaming. My answer was to simply use a wire connection, which didn't experience the same kind of problem, but I never quite understood why it happened. I tried a number of things to solve the problem, from removing the killer networking app to tweaking power options, but I never really invested a lot of effort into tracking it down. To tell you the truth, I didn't even realize that the problem had been solved until I came home from a business trip, forgot to plug the Ethernet cable back in, and then realized about a half hour later that I had downloaded an entire build of Windows 10 over Wi-Fi, with no problem. So who knows? So there you have it. The Titan may not be perfect, but it's good enough that it's worth overlooking its flaws, or at least I think it is. And I dare say that MSI does put together a good product, because that new Raider that I bought back in December is handling itself quite capably. It does have its quirks, but like the Titan before it, they're not that hard to deal with and you can usually just ignore them. Will my next system be an MSI? Who knows? All I know is the Titan kept me going for seven years straight, and problems or not, it's a keeper. What's your take on all this? Had you heard of MSI before you watched this or the unboxing video that came before it? Do you like the sound of the Titan? And I'm really curious about this. Would you be more inclined to buy a modular system with maxed out specs like I did, or would you start low and scale up as you went? Drop a comment below, and let's chat. That's all for now, but as always, thanks for tuning in, and until next time, this is Brandon Bridges reminding you the best way to be is B squared. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody.
Screw Flanders. Stupid yeah. sexy Flanders. It's like I'm wearing nothing at all.